Shabbat Shalom. Good morning. Good morning, Cindy. Freedom. Senator John McCain loved freedom and justice. <clears throat> As a young aviator in the United States Navy, John McCain was shot down over Hanoi, badly injured and taken capture by the Viet Cong. Because his father was a high-ranking officer in the Navy, the, the Vietnamese offered to let him go free for propaganda purposes. John McCain knew that that was not justice. He refused to be released early, and he remained captive at the infamous Hanoi Hilton for five and a half years. John McCain loved freedom, and he had a fierce sense of justice. And he spent the rest of his career fighting fiercely to ensure that his country, the United States, would always stand for both freedom and justice. At Senator McCain's funeral at Washington Cathedral, his close friend, Senator Joe Lieberman, recalled their trips to Israel together and how Senator McCain loved looking over Jerusalem, imagining its history. Israel's story is a miracle, but most of all, it is the story of justice and freedom. And no doubt, that is why John McCain loved Israel, and why this award, in his name, to the people of Israel, on the occasion of the State of Israel's 75th anniversary, is so appropriate. Executive Director McCain, ministers, distinguished officers, members of Congress, members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to award the 2023 John McCain Prize for Leadership in Public Service to the people of Israel. <laughs> Accepting on behalf of the people of Israel is a representative from Brothers in Arms, the largest civil aid organization in Israel. Brothers in Arms started as a protest movement against Israel's government's plans to reform the judiciary. On October 7th, the same day that Israel was attacked and the Jewish people experienced the greatest loss of life since the Holocaust, the very same day, Brothers in Arms pivoted and changed course to supply material aid to suffering Israelis in need. Only in a vibrant democracy could an organization protesting fiercely against the government one day then respond to urgent need and move all its efforts in a completely different direction the next. That is the power of freedom and justice. That is the power of democracy. And that is why John McCain would be so proud to be giving this award today. Here from Israel to accept the prize from Brothers in Arms is Lital Lashem, a major in the reserves of Israel's Defense Forces Southern Command. She has been active duty since October 7. Lital is an entrepreneur experienced in rapidly scaling startups into successful operating companies. She's a managing partner at a and Beyond, a venture capital firm based in Israel, the co-founder of Carbine, the world's premier cloud-based public safety solution. Lital is also a founding member of the UAE Israel Business Council. She has a, a long track record of scoping and implementing complex technology-enabled solutions for governments, military organizations, and civilian clients. And she has been a member of Brothers in Arms since its establishment. Lital, please come forward and accept this year's John McCain Prize for leadership in public service. We thought.
Thank you. 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 Wow. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. Your Excellencies, Ministers, Member of Parliament, Members of Congressional Delegations, Distinguished Officers, Ladies and Gentlemen. John McCain was a great friend of Israel and the Jewish people. His many years of service to his nation in the military and in the public arena serve as an inspiration to us, the people of Israel. We are delighted to be here with his esteemed wife, Ms. Cindy McCain, who continues to carry the torch of public service of her late husband. I am honored today to represent both the people of Israel and the organization that represents the best of Israeli society, brothers and sisters in arms. Together with many other groups of highly motivated Israeli civilians, we have dedicated the last year to saving the Jewish democratic state of Israel and our people. We proudly receive this Halifax Award in the name of all Israeli civil society. We established brothers and sisters in, in arms at the start of 2023 to oppose the change the current government was planning on implementing. And I am happy and pleased to tell you that the protests we led with tens of other civilian society groups, from high tech to women's rights to ex-security forces groups, managed to stop this revolution. But then on October 7, everything changed. Israel was invaded by a brutal terror organization that raped, murdered, and butchered over 1,200 of our people and kidnapped over 240 men, women, and children. Over 40 different nations were among those murdered and kidnapped. The majority of those kidnapped still remains hostages, hidden in Hamas tunnels within, without any access to International Red Cross. Our hearts are with them and their families, and we must do everything possible to bring them home. On the morning of October 7th, many of our members mobilized in their army units. Others went directly to the areas under attack to repeal the invasion and save our civilians. On the same day, our organization decided to, get, to dedicate all of its capabilities developed over the previous nine months to one, ensure the IDF wins. Second, to hug and support the home front, our civil society. And third, to bring Israeli society back together again. In the six weeks since Brothers and Sisters in Arms has grown into the largest civilian aid organization in Israel due to three main reasons. One, we have highly motivated volunteers willing to give their time and resources to serve their country. Two, we are an agile and flexible organization without biocracy. And third, we leverage state-of-the-art technology to accelerate and amplify our initiatives. This magical triangle, this magical triangle of highly motivated volunteers, a flat organization, and technology is what has enabled us to become the largest civilian aid organization in Israel in only six weeks. The incredible, the incredible mobilization of Israel civilian society since the horrors of October 7th has shown us that when we are united, we can overcome any obstacle. We do this together with our friends around the world who share the same deep democratic values that unite our nations. We look forward to building a better and brighter future for us all. And on a personal note, standing here as a proud Israeli woman in front of all of you important people 
who came here to discuss the future of the democratic world. Like you, I think about the future, but I do this from a perspective of a 30 weeks pregnant Israeli woman who wants her child to grow in a better world than the one we live in now. Thank you. You did so great. A number we've heard all morning. Number of Israelis murdered in the terrorist attack on October 7th, the highest number of Israelis killed on one day in the country's history. 1.5 million, the number of Gazans who have been displaced from their homes since October the 7th. That is three quarters of the population of Gaza. 250,000, the number of Israelis displaced from their homes, mostly in southern Israel, but also in northern Israel, as Hezbollah has fired rockets into those communities as well. 44,000, the number of Gazans killed or wounded since October the 7th, according to the Palestinian Ministry of Health in Gaza, which is run by Hamas. 368, the number of Israeli soldiers killed on or since October the 7th. That is the highest number since the Second Intifada. And finally, 100, the percentage of Gazans currently in need of humanitarian assistance. Ehud Barak, former prime minister, former defense minister, former IDF chief of staff, doesn't need an introduction. The goal of Israel's campaign according to Benjamin Netanyahu, is to eliminate Hamas's military capacity, its governance capacity, and Netanyahu this week added the, quote, de-radicalization of Gaza. Is that militarily possible? And what are the constraints on Israel and Gaza right now? I first of all uh, want to make some uh, preliminary remark. I'm, I thank you, Peter, and you, Cindy, for this moving event six weeks now after the uh, 7th of October. I never participated in such a uh, moving uh, moment uh, in Israel, not to mention anywhere abroad. And we thank you, and thank you as an Israeli for getting the award. John McCain was a great f friend for, of mine personally for decades. And uh, uh, this a young lady who <laughs> was here, she was part of the founders of certain high-tech company in which I'm involved. Mm -hmm. And 35 years ago, she's second generation fighter, 35 years ago, I was the commander of, of her father, who was a battalion commander in, in our armor, and a very good one. <laughs> And uh, so it's really moving, and I feel in a family and uh, feel so, so many faces of people who are devoted supporters of Israel. It's uh, great to be here this uh, morning. Now about your question, the objectives are the most justifiable one. After what you've seen or heard today, there is no way to avoid uh, taking uh, uh, those steps to eliminate the, the military capabilities of uh, Hamas and their capacity to, to uh, want to govern the Gaza Strip. And it, it cannot be executed just from the air. Many of your professionals fully understand it. It needs uh, many thousands of uh, pairs of boots on the ground in order to complete it. It takes time. But the whole operation is taking place under four uh, constraints. Each one of them can derail it and, and uh, block, block it from uh, reaching its objective. Number one is the hostages, the 240 or so. The second one is the need to 
minimize the risk that it will spread into a full regional uh, war with the Hezbollah in the, in the north and others. The third one is the, uh, the, the commitment to follow the international law, constrain our operation, and create a kind of a, a gradual, quite fast tip um, gradu uh, gradient of uh, losing the uh, legitimacy in the world. And the last one is, even if we assume that we, we achieve all these uh, objective, let's say, within uh, several months or more than several months, to whom we hand over the Gaza Strip. It's a major constraint because we do not intend to stay there for decades once again. Uh, so we are facing it. It's uh, usually people are so what should be done in order to achieve it, but it's all intertwined uh, uh, constraints and, and the the right answer always depends upon the details, the facts, the dynamics of development, not what we wish, but what happens on the ground. So it's still, uh, I'm convinced that we will uh, win this war, but uh, how exactly, it's, it's not yet clear. We're going to go through all of that. Uh, and, and one of my first questions um, needs to be about the numbers that I brought up, 1.5 million. Gazans who fled their homes, 44,000 number of Palestinians killed or wounded since October 7th, according to the Palestinian Ministry of Health in Gaza, which we know is controlled by Hamas, and 100% the number of Gazans who need humanitarian relief. In your opinion, why in the name of Israel's security, in the name of those goals that you identified, has Israel killed so many Palestinian civilians? Um. First of all, I'm not sure that the numbers are accurate, but it doesn't matter even if it were not uh, uh, many thousand, but only uh, 500. It doesn't matter. If, if there are civilians that should not be killed, it's, it's, we're sorry for it. But uh, Hamas deliberately deployed itself among the uh, civilian population, even deliberately used them. We know for years that the main command post was underneath the uh, Shifa uh, hospital, the bunkers, were built by Israeli architects at that time when we uh, built hospitals there. But uh, it was used for years by the Hamas. Uh, I, the same applied to another dozen or more hospitals in the whole area. Basically, those 1.5 million moved because we asked them to move. And Gaza Strip is very limited. We, with, uh, within a few hours on the walk, on, the, on, the, on, on foot, you can uh, move to the southern part. And uh, we ask for it because there is no way to hit the Hamas if we, you don't warn the people to, to leave. And uh, in a way, Hamas is at the, at the top of the causal chain of people killed on both sides. No, no, nothing to explain about the, the massacre, the barbarian uh, slaughtering of uh, 1,200 people inside this. This was made physically by them. But in the uh, case of the Palestinians, they are causing it. Basically, they hold those people who were uh, killed at the point of a gun to their heads, uh, blocking them sometimes physically from uh, leaving in order to have this, uh, um, this um, human shield. Now, Israel, any target is a search, a, sometimes more than once, by a, two different teams, and a legal advisor, expert of, of uh, international law, not of fighting, is sitting in the room to make sure that everything is done uh, as, as, as far as possible in a way that will uh, eliminate the risk or minimize the risk of uh, killing people. Every target is warned. People have warned from day one. Any one of you who knows that in a place where he's uh, living or where he's working, there is or there was in the last two years any activities of Hamas, be it a, a munition depot, a command post, a communication uh, device, training site, uh, launching pad for rocket or whatever, should leave his place because this is a target we are going to hit it. We uh, delayed the actual operation against certain neighborhoods in order to make sure that they uh, f uh, left. And uh, 
Mm. On the other hand, we cannot afford uh, providing Hamas a total impunity by just being able to have enough weapons and enough human fear uh, in the minds of the civilians that you can just hold them physically and say, you stay here because the Israelis are protecting us. So we are sorry for any life that were lost for, uh, without any kind of uh, making anything bad. But uh, that's part of a war. I, I've seen Israeli rules of engagement up close. I spent six uh, weeks in Gaza the last time Israel invaded uh, in 2014. Uh, and I saw how uh, Israel targeted Hamas commanders when it had intelligence. Israeli rules of engagement allow for that targeting from the air, even if that Hamas commander is surrounded by his family and the family upstairs has 10 people and the family downstairs has 10 people. There are lawyers sitting there right next to the person who pushes the button, but the United States does not have that rule of engagement. It would not take that shot. And this is why, in part, we are would seeing not, so many. Would not execute or? Would not execute with so many women and children. Why does Israel? Yeah, I, I'm not sure they told the story. I know of other stories, many of them. I was uh, present in one of them where the legal advisor said, uh, gentlemen, you cannot do it. At cert certain points, even of the reservation were raised by the pilots themselves. They say, uh, we see some of the operators of um, armed drones. Uh, we see someone uh, close and wait a minute uh, until it happens. Many cases we hit uh, targets, we were not aware that they are there. But you're describing a situation where it was clear. Because these there. people live. I mean, you call them civilian shields, but they're also called neighbors and family members. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, I, I cannot deny that people were killed there. But it was never a kind of something that was uh, planned. Sure. Uh, but you mentioned the American. I want to give you an example. Assume for a moment that some terror organization based in Tijuana, some of you know the place, or the West Bank, uh, West Coast, uh, on the Mexican side. And this uh, uh, organization uh, execute an, uh, a raid on uh, San Diego, whatever, and kill the equivalent numbers in American terms of 1,200 Israelis, about 40,000 people. So they massacred within a, 24 hours, 40,000 Americans slaughtered, mutilated, raped, whatever. I have no doubt that whoever sits in the White House will order to eliminate uh, Tijuana from Earth. It might have happened much faster in our case and with more devastated uh, consequences. Let's move to the last couple of days. The IDF has entered Shifa Hospital to target what uh, Israeli intelligence, US intelligence, and I personally know when journalists were criticized by Hamas, they were invited to Shifa Hospital to meet with Hamas. So they call it, Israeli US intelligence calls it a command and control. Is what you have seen in the last four days that Israel has found, does it match your expectations? Is it underwhelming, well, in, as, in, as uh, some have in, said? Uh, uh, Shifa? Yeah, in Shifa. And was it worth? the risk to the doctors and patients to go into Shifa, given what they have found? You know, I almost uh, feel that um, I am standing here as a kind of someone who has to explain. So I'll tell you, in order to avoid massive killing of doctor patients and probably Hezbollah, uh, Hamas people, we delayed it once and again. We delayed, we told them we are going to, to go there, we have to, um, uh, find what's going there. So uh, it's not a big secret that it allowed everyone who knew that we will do it to uh, try to erase any signs of whatever happened there, to take everything, to take the people, to take many things, and still there are many, a lot of evidence that it was there. We have, I have no doubt that the uh, CIA and the NSA know almost as much as we know, and they would verify that there, are, there was a command post underneath the uh, Shifa. Although, although U.S. intelligence now, officials now, do no, admit no, no, their no, focus no. has not been gotten no, no. anyway. But yeah. you mentioned the possibility hmm. that probably uh, we were aware or, or we were 
uh, careless about the what will happen to the patient. I didn't say doctor. that. I just just risking the life. You just no, insinuated. Okay. So we took all the steps. We have people who worked with them for years. Some of them are a little bit older, but even the leaders of the hospital are uh, older and they know each other. So they made sure, first of all, to tell them exactly what we are going to do to tell them exactly how we are going to do it in order to avoid risk to the doctors and to the nurses and to the patients. Then we left there certain uh, kind of, uh, they needed the urgent oil supply for their generators and for the babies and so on. So we left there at the opening uh, uh, kind of uh, some fuel. It was taken by Hamas. We uh, well, executed awesome. very carefully. Not a single doctor was hurt. Not a single patient. There are probably two or three thousand people there. None had been touched or hurt. I'm not sure that we, we have that confirmed, but okay. That, that's the argument of, of what Israel has done. The United States has been very supportive overall for Israel, and that comes straight from President Biden. However, the United States is shifting, the United States government, I should say, has shifted its language. Um, uh, on October the 12th, Secretary of State Antony Blinken flew to Israel and started his speech by saying, I come before you as a Jew. That was Blinken's opening line, supporting Israel. On November the 10th, Blinken left Israel, and his quote was, far too many Palestinians have been killed. You yourself have talked about this. You thought that Israel only has a few weeks before U.S. support shifts. So do you believe that Israel only has now one or two weeks before it risks losing U.S. support? Look, I'm not sure that it's clever to analyze and predict how long. I can explain you the uh, dilemma. We have to finish it. We know from our experience, you know, I remember uh, the United States sending some of its forces over half of the globe to make sure that uh, Daesh or uh, Al-Qaeda is destroyed in certain corners of the world, in Iraq or somewhere else in the Middle East. And we have it a uh, few, uh, probably a mile beyond our border and be, be, be far from our citizens. So we have to complete it. It's a compelling imperative. Israel government cannot survive, cannot live up to its very basic commitment to its citizens. Uh, if Hamas can control or come back as a military uh, power. So we highly respect the really a moving kind of support by the administration of the United States of America, deployment of everything that we can think of to back us and deterring Iran, Hezbollah, and even working with the neighbors about the, the morning after. So we highly appreciate this, but at the same time, Israeli government, and I'm one of the harshest critique of this government, but it cannot uh, live up to its commitment if it stops this operation before the military capability of Hamas is practically uh, non-existent. And uh, it's true that probably more thought had been to be invested from day one about the uh, day after, the morning after, and because this cannot be done by Israel alone. It needs other players, and uh, the United States is the leader of this axis of moderate uh, Sunnite government together with Israel facing the rogue axis led by Iran, uh, Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas, others, and backed by Russia, and indirectly even to an extent by China. So the whole thing in American eyes is global. In Israeli, uh, uh, perspective is it's much more local, but much more concrete. And I, uh, I believe that Israel will do whatever it takes to complete the job, but will have to take into account the American position. It's too important for us. And I, I, don't, I don't expect it to carry it for many months now. The, uh, the Americans say no reoccup reoccupation of Gaza, but Netanyahu's been clear he does not want this Palestinian authority running Gaza. Palestinian authority told my colleague Leila Malone Island that we will not go into Gaza on the back of an Israeli tank. And at least publicly, different thing, privately, but publicly, the Arab governments, as you have said, 
want nothing to do with this. So I ask again, is reoccupation inevitable? No, we, you know, the word reoccupation can uh, carry several meanings in English, at least for my limited uh, <laughs> con uh, control of this language. Uh, we do not plan to reoccupy Gaza Strip and stay there. No. And our government, uh, the present government, really make a major mistake. And Netanyahu is the uh, prime minister for the last 10 uh, most of the last 15 years. Um, the policy of the last five years, stated by our government, which could put in a concise way by one of the ministers, said uh, Hamas is an asset, Palestinian Authority is a liability, mm -hmm. rather than the other way around. And it was Netanyahu's formal position. Oh, yeah for the wrong reasons for years now. The and allowing reason, Qatar to bring in briefcases. No, no, some, some, of stuff, the, yeah. some of the audience do not know what's the political behind, politics behind it. Mm. There is a political, uh, the, the real idea of this right-wing government is that whoever wants to block the road towards two-state solution should prefer the Hamas, keep him uh, alive and kicking. The reason is that as long as Hamas is there as a terror organization, whenever the Americans or the world or anyone uh, outside Israel approaches us with the demand, why the hell do you don't negotiate with the Palestinians? We can easily say, how can we? Uh, Abu Mazen in the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah does not control half of his people in Gaza. And when you look into this half of people, they are controlled by terror organization, even according to you. So we can't do anything. So it was a deliberate effort to uh, block it, and which, which I think is a major, a grave mistake. We should do the other way around. And even now, in the long side, it's not the right time to deal, the, the, talk with it, because the blood is still boiling, and many people are... are but, but certainly the day after is a big question. Looking uh, for revenge. Yeah. But when the time comes, that's the only solution, is a two-state solution. I've asked a lot of direct questions. The audience is coming up. But of course, we need to ask one question about Ukraine before I turn to the audience. The, the premise of all of these panels is this. So let me just ask you directly. If Putin wins in Ukraine, how would that affect Israel? Uh, it, it's bad for the world, and it's bad for Israel as a part of the world. It's, it doesn't have a direct impact on Israel. But I think that our government made a grave mistake by not standing behind Ukraine from day one. To refuse uh, to no, visit no, and, and to send weapons. No other country, probably no other country on earth should be more instinctively go to support Ukraine the, the reason, the ether of Israel was to establish a place which expressed our uh, self-evident right for self-determination for the Jewish people. And we should be the first to resist any, the idea that a certain country or group of countries can decide that another a neighbor should be eliminated from, from the map and from history. That's exactly what Putin is trying to do to Ukraine. So we should be there uh, diplomatically and politically and, first of all, morally mm. uh, from day one. Uh, people ask, why don't you send them uh, the, uh, these miracle magic uh, Iron, Iron Dome. Dome? So the truth is that uh, Ukraine is only about 30 times the size of Israel. <laughs> there is a limited uh, area that this uh, battery can cover. And uh, we don't have enough, don't yeah. spread the word, enough batteries <laughs> no, no, to protect Israel effectively. That's, and it's not, not it's not a hypothetical threat. We, we suffered the first morning some 3,000. Right. And, and in fact, the Israelis have needed the U.S. Yeah, to send we, more We cannot afford it now, but we should support them in many other ways yeah. where we could. OK, so there's a lot of questions about this topic. We'll try and get through uh, a lot. We've got uh, 15 to 20 minutes or so. So uh, around the room. Jane. Jane. Ladies first. Jane is first. Good morning, Jane Harmon. Um, I was in Congress on 9-11. I think some of my former colleagues were, too, when uh, or on 9-11. And after 9-11, Congress authorized, by a vote of 434 to 1, 
uh, the use of military force uh, in Afghanistan to go after the organization that had attacked us. I just would observe, I think that's exactly what Israel is trying to do. Uh, my question to you, Ehud, is that you and some of the prime ministers before Bibi Netanyahu made enormous efforts uh, to achieve a two-state solution, and I think it might be useful for this audience just to hear how close we came with the support of a variety of U.S. presidents. A, a, a short version of the history of the peace process. Yeah. Perhaps, so perhaps I, so focus on 2000 and, and of course, uh, Bill Clinton's efforts in the end. So uh, it's true that many of us made an effort since uh, we have been in Paris. And even Netanyahu, he, he found a friend in Arafat and uh, was uh, ready to propose a two-state solution. Uh, it failed. It failed at the time, mainly because of the Palestinians. They were unripe yet to, to, to make this tough decision uh, in Arafat case of turning from a kind of a terror hero into the guy who has to solve problems of education, social security, sewage, and you name it, and he probably was not built for it. I don't know. So uh, I think that it's, it's known well enough that we, we tried and the American uh, helped us. But I think that what really happened is in the recent years, it uh, the Israelis looking around and seeing this, uh, what, what seems to be eternal quarrel with the uh, Palestinians, and uh, turn more to the right. There is a majority. This, this government was elected freely by the public. On a verge, on a very, very uh, light uh, edge, they won election, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, they later on turned into this judicial reform that happened to be, uh, to be ju judicial coup d'etat. And in order to uh, release Netanyahu from his court case, they built a coalition based on extreme right-winger, messianic, uh, messianic kind of uh, racist uh, guys. I compared them to these two guys of the proud boys who were sent to prison for 20 and 15 years respectively, think of American president nominate one of them to be secretary of treasury with certain formal role in the Pentagon, and the other one to make a homeland security secretary. So it's, we are in a quite a crazy situation on our own, even without the Palestinians. And no one think or thought in the past of having a peace negotiation with Hamas. We think that the, it's not too late even now, with a weakened Palestinian Authority, with the backing of the Arab uh, moderate countries to create what they think for the day after as a multinational Arab force backed by the Arab League, probably by United Nations Security Council resolution if the Russians will not veto it, uh, and for sure by, backed by Americans, Saudi money, Qatari money, establish this fort, it will take over the uh, Gaza Strip for a limited period of time, three or six months, during which they will bring back the Palestinian Authority, which is the original internationally recognized owner of the place. They were yeah. removed by could, uh, violent coup d'etat of the Hamas and should be brought back. That's, that's my proposal or thought, but although, although again, there might be others. And the Israeli government has basically ruled out at least the yeah. current form yeah, yeah. of the Palestinian Authority. Yeah, a part of, uh, take, I, think uh, that, I think that even uh, Lital mentioned it, that we are in a height of an operation to remove this government, but that's, uh, that's our business, not, okay. not yours. Next question, uh, all the way on the end here, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much indeed. My name is Roderich Kiesewetter from the German Parliament. Thank you, Mr. Barak, for your moving words. You said that a victory of Putin would not have a direct impact on Israel. I do not concur. However, would you concur with the sentence that an immediate or sudden victory of Israel against Hamas would have an impact on Ukraine because international awareness will re-raise towards Ukraine? Hmm. And second brief remark, you were one of those who Sorry. were... Very brief. One question. Iran, how to contain and to avoid to become a nuclear power. Thank you. All right. Uh, <laughs> let's take the first one. I'm, not, does, I'm, does not, the I'm not sure that, uh, that I understood which, what, what assumption uh, the gentleman Just take made. the first question. Does it, would a Ukrainian, sorry, would an Israeli victory in Gaza help 
Ukraine because it would actually shift international media attention and overall attention back to Ukraine. You know, would is there a I am, connection I am between Israeli Israel, victory and helping Ukraine? I, I'm I'm for Israeli uh, imminent victory, even without Ukraine, and for sure, if it helps Ukraine in any way, uh, I'm I would be glad to to hear that. And and we'll do the the Iran nuclear uh, if if we can come back to it uh, over on this side, please. Thanks. Good morning, sir. Thank you for speaking with us. You began uh, to sorry, stitch, identify yourself, please. Uh, Jim Baker, Pentagon. You began to explain. Related to the original one? Or no? <laughs> no, sir. I'm from Ohio, not Texas. <laughs> you began to sketch what a two state solution might look like. I wonder if you might extend that analysis to include the role you think the United States would need to play, what Iran would need to do, how the Arab states would need to react over, say, the next 20 years or so. What are the specific milestones we should look for? Perhaps you might begin with the re-election of Ehud Barak in 2024. <laughs> hey, I should admit that I'm not sure that even in Halifax, half a globe <laughs> uh, far from the Middle East, it's a right moment, so to speak, to discuss the details of how to create a, a Palestinian state to state solution. Not because I don't believe in it, but because I think that it creates a a, a dissonance with the real needs. Our youngsters are now uh, fighting there. Uh, some of them that I know their parents, as I knew many other parents of other soldiers and officers, might be hit by the news that their uh, beloved one just killed or exploded in, in some tunnel or whatever. I don't think that we should find the energy, but it's not a secret. I great believer in the old Roman saying that if you do not know which port you want to reach, no wind will take you there. Mm. And those of you who sail from time to time know that with headwinds coming exactly ahead of you, you have even to zigzag, but you zigzag on the way to certain place that you know. So the long-term vision should be a two-state solution. And the reason is simple and painful between the uh, river and the sea, as the pro-Palestinian uh, kind of slogan goes now, they will leave some uh, 15 million people, give and take half of them Jews, half not Jews. If those block of uh, millions can vote, this is a binational state overnight, and within a very short period, historically speaking, it's a binational state with a Muslim majority. Jews would end up being That's Muslim. not the Zionist dream. If they cannot vote permanent, permanently, and they do not vote temporarily for just 56 years now, but if it becomes formally a permanent, a long temporary. This is not this is not a democracy. I don't want to use the name from neighboring uh, continent in the previous century or previous millennium. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's not a democracy. So we have a compelling imperative. That's what I find so hard to explain to Israel. It's not because of justice for the Palestinians, which is worse, uh, worse kind of a subject probably on its own, but that's not on our highest uh, priority. Because we have a compelling imperative to disengage with the Palestinians, to find a delineated line within the promised land, which will include probably 80% of the settlers, all our uh, strategic interests, and cover only single uh, digit percentage of the area of the West Bank, and have this uh, line, the border, a uh, recognized border of Israel, under agreement, and leave in a flourishing Israel, side by side with a uh, demilitarized, independent Palestinian state, which covered the uh, part of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And That's that should be the vision. But I have to tell you the right. sad reality. More than half, a little bit more, but more than half of the Israeli public believe the opposite, right. that there should be a one-state solution, and they believe that it's realistic in spite of the fact that uh, I do not believe. More than half of Israelis don't believe in two-state, more than half Palestinians don't believe in two-state, and nobody in the current coalition, not the war cabinet, the coalition uh, advocates for that. But that's certainly the vision and, and one that still exists for many. Uh, okay, question right here. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Michal kotler wunsch Israel Special Envoy for Combating Anti-Semitism. And I want to start by thanking Peter um, for that recognition. And I want to make sure that we understand it's the recognition of all of the people of Israel right now under existential threat, fighting side by side, pro-judicial review, uh, reform, against judicial reform, fighting side by side, right and left, fighting side by side, no matter who they voted for. And right now we have a unity government. And what I wanted to actually ask, uh, uh, Ehud Barak, and it's funny that I would ask you, to make sorry, sure that I only I'll ask slow. the question. You know, from the perspective of anti-Semitism, which fueled the atrocities of October 7th, but also fuel the responses to the atrocities of October 7th, including the false moral equivalents that we hear over and over again. So that 9-11 is ab absolutely the reason that the United States of America had to ensure that Al-Qaeda and then later ISIS cease to exist, whereas that same understanding is not afforded to the state of Israel. But it's not just Hamas, a proxy of the genocidal terror regime of Iran that carries that anti-Semitism, but actually the PA leadership that not a month ago peddled the same anti-Semitism between Holocaust denial, the severance of the state of Israel, right to exist with a uh, understanding that Jews as an indigenous people return to an ancestral homeland, and the severance of Jews from the Middle East altogether. Oh, and that's, sorry, I just okay. want to ask Here's about the, the two state you, solution. You talk too slowly for <laughs> the sorry. question. I'm sorry. I just want to ask about the two-state solution, which we all believe in, and in many ways, I think that 100% of Israelis would agree in the two-state solution, provided that it would first include the recognition of the right of the state of Israel to exist in any borders. And I, I would want to ask you about your opinion about that and why that I, hasn't I, been what we I will demand. Answer. I will answer you, but I expect you to stay uh, relaxed when I answer. <laughs> Zionism was a rebellion against the fate of the Jewish people that culminated or got its climax at the first pictures in the movie that we have seen. Zionism was based on the idea that we are taking our fate in our hands. We stop to relying on what others think or what others recognize or don't, don't, do not. We take it in our hands and change the direction of history. In the same period, some 130 years ago, from the area under the Tsar, of the kind of domain where Jews were allowed to live, 1.3 or 1.4 million people left. 1.25 went to America, and a small fraction to South Africa or Australia. Only uh, less than 40,000 came to Palestine. Some of them get tired and left and the 25,000 that remain change the direction of history by making the, com the, the defining uh, element of their identity. We do not wait to others to recognize us. We will do whatever it takes until we get the recognition of the whole world. We got it in the um, 29th of November, 47. Since then, we made peace with Arab neighbors. I brought up fighting against uh, Egyptian for my, all my youth. And when I came first to Cairo as a minister of foreign affairs of Israel, the, my first request was to go to the tomb of the unknown uh, Egyptian soldier. And Amr Musa asked me, why the hell you want to see it? So I know him, you don't know him. I know him, I fought him, I probably killed him, and I could understand that his family never heard of him, and I want to pay respect. He was a, a good fighter. We, if we assume your assumption that there's something eternal built into nature, uh, nature, human nature and evolution that makes it impossible forever because this or that thing that they said, it's defined, it's once again giving others the opportunity to define us. We will define ourselves. Mm -hmm. We never asked the Egyptians, never, to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. We assume that we are there, we are strong, we are stronger than any neighbor thousand miles around Israel, in spite of this devastating blow that we got on 7 October, we are still the strongest country all around the Middle East. And as such, we did not ask the Egyptians. We never asked the Jordanians. I was deeply involved in the negotiation. No, never raised this idea that we need the recognition of King Abdullah about our right to stand. We are, we are defining our 
right to uh, exist as a, as a uh, Jewish state. We didn't ask it from the Lebanese when we had a peace with them. We never raised it with Syria. Netanyahu went to uh, make a peace with Assad before I tried, <laughs> and he never mentioned it. So the only reason that we made it a spatial demand from the Palestinian has to do with political motivation. It was one more trick to create a counter response that will make it appear as if there is no way to make a peace with them. We have enough common sense to judge that Hamas is not a partner. I am the originator of the, of the saying, we do not have a partner. Uh, after Camp David, but that's not exactly what I have said. I said something much more uh, accurate. I said, we do not have a partner in Arafat at the present. I didn't say we won't have, I didn't say anything like that. So we are against anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. We are for a strong Israel, but I do not believe that this idea of putting something that no way will ever be uh, accepted yeah. to uh, <laughs> demand as a precondition from our rivals to admit our perception of basically the self-evident perception the, the, that we are independent power and we have right to define our um, trajectory in, in the world. Okay, I think I just have two more questions, so let's just uh, take them both together. Uh, Patrick all the way in the back, and then you right here. So let's just go back to back very quickly, and I'll get uh, quick, quick uh, answers, and then. Thank you. Patrick Tucker from Defense One. Uh, a lot of people would consider the size of the settlements in the West Bank to be the major barrier to a two-state solution, uh, and settlement harassment to Palestinians in the West Bank has been increasing tremendously since October 7th. So very quickly, what is the realistic strategy for reversing the settlement policy when no administration beforehand has, has been able to do it. Yeah, and, and I, hold, I on, think hold on, hold on, hold on. One more question, sorry. And then, Thank and you, Mauricio Meshulam you, from Mexico. You, I'll risk, remember, I'll remember. Risk me uh, not remembering the uh, previous. I, I will remember, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Uh, on the information warfare, despite of what you have described now as the national security interests of Israel, on the information warfare, this is not being perceived as such. So Israel is not actually winning the information warfare. So at what point does the losing the information warfare uh, impacts on the national security of Israel in order for it to actually make a decision to stop? I start with the second one. We, I, I do not believe in stopping a kind of uh, vital uh, security interest issues just on the results, based, based on the results of the information war. Yeah. Information war, we do not control the social network. We, we do not, never pretended to control the wishes, dreams, or, or thoughts of other people. And probably some in this world, especially, I saw some of these. Uh, Titles here behind tells you that uh, in the modern uh, day there is an uninvited voter even into ele elections, uh, the, f uh, the, the form of this uh, information war. I, I, we have a crucial interest when it comes to national uh, security interests. We act upon them, not upon what anyone in the world uh, think about it. And then, and then about the settlements. Uh, I, once again, I don't think that it's the right time when we, uh, we uh, fight. Uh, many of the uh, victims, uh, especially among soldiers, are brought up and, and, and live in those settlements. They are part of our unity that the lady mentioned. We fight side by side, mm -hmm. something in the same unit. There are settlers and, and people from this kibbutzim around Gaza Strip, who are, most of them are extreme leftists. And uh, they fight together <laughs> to win. Uh, but having said that, I mentioned in my, in my um, previous answer that there is a way to delineate a line that will include a heavy majority, I believe still 80% of the settlers within the uh, line that I propose. And still, the line will not cover no more than uh, 9 percent or 10 percent of the whole area. So there is a technical solution. Of course, the settler movement believe 
that by spreading more and more of them, especially outside of what we call the settlement blocks, but isolated settlements here and there all around the area, they promote the, the uh, situation that there will we cross certain point of no return where it's impractical again. Nothing is impractical. Don't use the word inevitable about military development and about political development. I don't want to right. go back to history to show how many things that were believed to be beyond any kind of uh, question ended up to be the opposite when the, the uh, carpet of the future rolled uh, kind of uh, open. Anyway, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much. Thank you for taking all my thank questions you. and the audience's questions, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. <laughs>